presenting myself today to you as a mutant. In fact, most of us in this room are mutants, and we never took the time to think about it, really. For me, uh, the process started uh, a couple of years ago, in fact, 30 years ago. Me and my wife had a very prosperous uh, graphic design studio. We've been running for several years. We had uh, several employees. And looking at that picture, which was the studio at the time, I realized that my studio was still very much uh, connected to the Gutenberg era. We had uh, typesetting catalogs. We were full of paper, scissors, and glue. And suddenly, in 1984, that machine, that first computer, came into our lives and uh, into our industry. We didn't realize at the time that actually the virus of that mutation was the computer. And a little bit like most of everybody, what we saw in the graphic design industry was the first to be touched by the computers and the uh, digital world. Uh, most of you think that music uh, or things like that were the ones that were affected, but the first industry that was affected was really graphic design and printing, Gutenberg. So within the la next decade, thousands of typesetters lost their jobs in Montreal. Thousands of people who were working with films and plates lost their jobs. So as a graphic designer, being in the center of that storm, I started to think that it could, should be time to take notes and try to understand what, what that change would mean in the future. Well, first of all, as a graphic designer, I realized that my role was to help humans understand uh, complex information. And that even though we would have the best computers in the world, humans had to gain information through their nervous system the same way they did before, in order to be able to know where to click, where to push that button. If they didn't know how, where to push, where, which button they should push, it was impossible for the computer to answer them. So thinking about that, I said, oh, that's cool. So then my, my, sorry, my trade is OK. I, I'm a storyteller. I'm there to help people understand. So whatever form of communication, I'll be still working, which is what happens till today. But as a communicator and as a parent of two young child, I realized that from that day in 1984, things would never be the same. So I started taking notes, a little bit like Darwin. I had my mutation notebook in which I started to do graphics to try to understand what was happening, because nobody was no knowing what happening. Even today, we still are still searching what is going to change in our society because of the computers. So today I'd like to share with you one of the many graphics and schematics I've put into that notebook, which I think today after 30 years is probably the most important one, since it's the one that has been the key for me to, kind, to gain a sense of where we're going from here, from there to the future. So this is the story of man, modern man. After grunting for 10,000 generations, we actually started to speak almost 3,333 generations ago. So with words, suddenly we were able to exchange concepts. Our daily lives generated information, and we would pass that on orally from people to people and to memory to memory. Uh, keeping the stories of our lives to, to go from generation to generation. Then 333 generations ago, we started writing. For the first time, we were able to capture information, put it on a piece of paper, and send it to somewhere else. Even though I was not there, people can understand what I had written. So that started to change information through society, and people started to exchange information. But at the same time, we have to understand that 333 generations ago, it was mostly the kings and the scholarlies who would read. Most of the people were still relying on orality and memory. 
Then suddenly, about three, 33 generations ago, uh, add or, or, or take a, a couple, uh, the pressure of people wanting to learn uh, to read and things like that created the, uh, a demand. I mean, manuscript, up, up until that date, books were written by hand. Suddenly, with the printing, that could uh, disseminate a lot more information. And that was the start of my trade, actually. So sharing information enabled to concentrate inf uh, a lot of knowledge in a book. So that book was a little bit like compressed time that somebody could take and learn things that it would take several lives to learn before. That kind of information generated a lot of innovations and created the Industrial Revolution. Suddenly, everybody lived in cities close to the factories. At the same time, suddenly, the, the government and the industry decided in order to keep the children's away, because at that time there was a movement in which children were starting to go into the, uh, to the manufacturing plants, and the adults kind of revolted. They said, no, 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 this is, we, we are the people who need to bring the money into the family. The children should stay at home. So the government and the companies decided it was time to start teaching to read and write to everybody. And they created the public schools. At the same time, the public school had another very interesting aspect. It enabled children to learn to read, to write, to stay calm, to write reports, to come on time, and slowly and gradually, get out of the home and be prepared to work in some, somewhere else. But at the same time, th there was a, v uh, uh, a wave of innovation created by electricity and electronics soon with the vacuum tubes and all of these kinds of things. So I kind of wanted to put myself back into those days and saying, well, if they're giving a school book to the children, well, for sure, with the, the, the rate of innovations, they have to teach the children, they had to teach the children at the time how to communicate. So this is a little bit of the, the, the way, the speed of things, at which speed the books might have changed during those, those periods. So in 18, uh, 1880, the book changed because we had to teach the children there was a new invention which was called a telegraph. Telegraph was the first time in, in the history that the message could go faster than the messenger. That was quite uh, important. Normally, based on the past, we would have taken a couple of generations to teach our children what will be the impacts of the telegraph and how that will change society. But the, fir but the first time, the, the generation after that, saw the introduction of uh, uh, recorded audio. Fifteen years after that, we saw the introduction of film. Fifteen years after that, we saw the introduction of telephone. Fifteen years after that, we saw the introduction of radio. Television, fifteen years after. Fax and electronics, fifteen years after that. And suddenly, that was the brink, the start, of a major wave that changed, which came with the digital revolution. So fifteen years after that was the introduction of the computer. That's when it came into my office. It's, I didn't have one before because I couldn't afford one. I didn't have one before because they didn't exist. So suddenly, 15 years after that, from the computer came the network, and we saw the arrival of Netscape and the web. And now today, 15 years after that, we have all these technologies in our pocket, and we can talk face to face with anybody around the world, something that has never been done in the, in the past. For the first time in history, 10 consecutive generations saw the introduction of major communication tools, what other people call intellectual tools. The way these tools came in, that was the first time in history. Before we had time to learn a technology and teach it to our children, but for the last 10 generations, each generation that was born saw a technology that was not known by their parents when they were the same age as they were. So nobody knew. Nobody knew how to teach each other. So now we're in a society in which everybody is trying to find <laughs> what to, how to teach the others. McLuhan has a very good phrase for that. Media, by altering the environment, evokes in us unique ratios of sense perceptions. The extensions of any one sense alters the way we think and act the way we perceive the world. And when these ratio change, 
men change. So, at the same time, the, the increase of life, because of, because of information, because of better knowledge of health, has put us in a space in which, for the first time in history, we have five different generations that are living at the same time in, in the society. So not only do we use different technologies for different generations, but we're also, we've never been so one on top of the other before. People that were born and, 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 and uh, educated before 1985, like me, were educated in a world in which every information was fixed. You had to put that information on a piece of paper, on a film, but once it was there, you had to have that piece of paper or that film with you in order to decode that information. The other thing is the only people who could decode information were human brains. Suddenly, after 1985, we come to a, a world in which information is a process. Information is not fixed. So suddenly, we're going into a world in which information can be reorganized, mashed up, put on the web. I can look at it at my phone, then continued looking at it on the TV or on a computer, printed on a piece of paper. It's the same information. That information can move and can move wherever it want to go. At the same time, that pressure has put a lot of pressure in society. Because right now, what we see is that the people who sign the checks, the people who manage the society, are mostly people who were born before 1985. So these people who already had to go from radio to television to cinema to electronics now have to completely change their mind as to a way that we're not in a fixed world anymore, we're in a processing world today. So now you can understand a little bit why it's so difficult to have them take a decision on the future of electronics or on the future of a digital society. They still don't get it. They still don't think it's there. They still think that before was better than today. And they're not sure that they're going to release everything to that digital world. While the young people in this world, those who are born after 85, consider that it's the only world they know. There's no other world. That's the reality. Why are we not moving? So suddenly, we have to realize that all the laws on which our society is built today were written before 1985. They were all written in a world that had fixed information, fixed borders, things that you could control. Now, we know today that this world is changing and won't exist anymore. The world, the network in which we are there, already knows what we do. The network knows who we are, and we've learned recently it knows a lot more than we would like it to know, okay? But still, in Canada, 45% of the people today were born and raised before the computer. Half of their, half of their lives were, were before the, the, the arrival of computers. 78% of the people in Canada were born before the, the, the arrival and, and raised and, and educated before the arrival of the web. And the web natives, most of them still can't vote. So, but not for long. So things are changing. And it's a very good, important thing to do because if 30 years ago, the leaders of the world today were trained with books and auditoriums like we have here, the ones who will lead the world in the next 30 years will be trained with Twitter, Facebook, computers, collaborative, working in teams around the world, a very, very different environment. So what are, this is real, this needs a little bit more than just an update. We have to take time to think about this. We have to take time collectively, all generations to think together of what we're going to do. Hackers were the first ones to really understand that a computer is a tool to make tools. We can do whatever we want with it. It's a very good situation at a time in which society is going through its most important uh, challenges, uh, economics, environments, social. The computer could help us really to get through these problems. Maybe it's the idea that we were waiting for in order to go another level. But at the same time, if we just take it for granted, that machine can kill us. It can kill our society. 
It can kill our, our, our way of being together. So now's the time. I, I really want to tell you that. I think now's the time. It's the last period in history that we can take time to discuss about this. Because in a couple of years, there won't be anybody who was there before the computer arrived to, to, to know what other forms of, of society we can bring. And I think that's a very, very important issue. The chasm, after everybody who was there before the computers will die, there won't be anybody to, to tell you what, was, what it was when there was no computers, how we could work and play and organize ourselves. That whole history of human race has been through collaboration and discussion. We lost that in the last 10 generation. We have the illusion that we're talking to a lot of people, that we're doing a lot of things, but actually we're not doing so much. We're actually consuming what the companies of technologies want us to do. But we're not very uh, reactive to that. The idea is not to be against computer. The idea is to think about what we want to do with them. Never forget that we're just starting on that route. And as Marshall McLuhan once again said, first we shape our tools, and then our tools shapes us, like text and electronics did before. Thank you.